Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, very kind invitation for me to be here this morning. We acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land we are working in and we are conferring on this morning. We acknowledge the uh, Roti Shuba and the people of uh, Nandon Mai. We acknowledge the uh, High Chiefs of Rewa, Namadin Tu Burmasanga. And uh, we are here at Shuba Bo House, house built by, uh, during the time, the SVT government to acknowledge the sacrifice of the people of Suva who were moved from their traditional Yabu of uh, particularly the uh, Tisuva of Nainkasinkasini Maramanibau. We do not know where that is. That is the site of government house or state house now. The Rokoti Suva is also known as Namantura and Rokoti Suva no Pasuimbao. Many generations ago of the Rokoti Suva, the uh, Randini Vanua went out uh, shell fishing. When she came back, that small wet patch between Remba and the, the state house had always been there. She slipped on the slope and crawled up to the chief's house. So the chief say, named that place Nainkasinkasini Maramanibau. I think Ratisong Avindi knows that very well. Almost 60 years ago, I did my public service induction training on this site. This was the site of the old public service training center. And our instructor then was Ken Vera, working for the Public Service Commission. And those of us coming out of secondary schools while waiting for the New Zealand secondary uh, university entrance examination would come and spend a week doing induction training. The first lot included Mr. Posey Dimbune. I came in in the third lot after 1966 school year. I finished my induction training and we were waiting for our postings when the uh, former commander who was then adjutant of the 2nd Battalion of the Fiji Infantry Regiment, later Colonel Paul Manueli, called me to say, are you still interested in the Army? I said, yes sir. Where are you? I'm in Wailebu West in the sub -Sabu. You have to be here on Monday. So I went up to camp had my kit issued and I was walking down to the barracks, walking, while the uh, soldier escorting me was marching. I didn't know then that everybody walking around camp should, be, should have been marching. When Manueli called up, I saw Mr. Walker's car outside Manueli's office. I said, what's Mr. Walker doing here? Mr. Walker was our principal at QVS. Manueli stood on the balcony and called me, Mr. Benny, said, sir, can you come up here for a while? I went up, and Mr. Walker was sitting there, smiled at me, bowed his head again, sat down. Manueli told me, uh, Mr. Benny, Mr. Walker wants you to go back for another year at school. I was very disappointed. 
But I went back, spent another year at school, and came straight back into the army. But this was the site of the government training center at that time. And we had induction training. All those coming out of secondary schools, waiting for university entrance examination results. And when they came out, they went on to university. Those that were left, or did not get their name, while they asked for a recount, some were determined and had decided to stay on the civil service. It was a very interesting first week, or one week. At Queen Victoria School, in those days, after the last paper, we'd all gather together for a ceremonial burning of pens, rulers, and paper. We thought that was the end of learning, end of examinations. And the following year, or the first week in January, we were here. First thing issued to us were pen, paper, and ink. Some had ballpoint pens at the time. I still carry a fountain pen. And I'm 74, 74 years old, so don't blame me for, for hanging on to uh, some old habits. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, honored to be here this morning. I also feel very guilty that we're trying to uh, enforce retirement ages moving them around from 50 to 55, 50 and then 60. I'm here addressing you, looking forward to my 75th birthday. My first uh, birthday as Prime Minister was 44, September 1992. What have all these got to do with what we're here for? You have chosen your career. You want to be civil servants. And I'm sure you know the meaning of those two words. For a long time in the history of Fiji, most of our senior civil servants were former military personnel. It was the nature of the world at the time. When our colonial masters went out to colonize and further the civilization of their colonies, the most readily available were former soldiers. And when they came out, they wore the uniforms they wore when they were seconded or posted to posts in areas and countries or colonies in Africa. And they wore in Africa safari suits. I'm wearing my safari suit this morning deliberately, so that we can focus our attention, what we are inheriting, how we have moved from those days to the modern civil service of Fiji, the government services of the country we love, our homeland, born in, die in. You are privileged to be selected after you applied to serve the people of Fiji. Matt is looking very angrily at me because he's prepared a good speech for me to, to read this morning. And I'm not reading it. But that is the result of good speech writing. 
One of the things you will be learning or uh, revising today in your program is speech writing. And one of the first things we learned during induction training in those years gone by was speech writing. And we had just finished writing essays as answers to our examination, to the examination questions sent to us by New Zealand authorities to pass, first of all, the New Zealand school certificate and then university entrance. We thought we had done, we had done with that. We came here and that's the first thing we did. Pick up a pen and a piece of paper and learn to write. I thought we were going to go back and learn A, B, C and, and so on. When I went to, uh, to England, I saw Bosco. And Fiji was waiting for him to come back. He was doing a printing course to be a government printer. And his team in England said, no, no, we can't let him go. He said, he came here to learn printing. What's he doing? No, he's into his third year. He's into, uh, into C now. Next year it'll be D. So that's the rate we learn printing. I do not know when we can start writing. Ladies and gentlemen, you are part of a very big industry. You serve the whole population of Fiji. Last week, somebody mentioned to me that we are now hit the one million mark, all told, in Fiji and abroad. And you serve them. And you are part of a very big, of the biggest workforce in Fiji, 35,000. 35,000 serving one million and the rest of the international community that we interact with. We're holding this workshop because in February there was a leaders' summit in Nandi. And I told Pramesh, we could have done better than this. And when we met the Human Resources Institute conference, I told him, please organize a series of civil service workshops or civil servants workshops. We would like to improve the service and the delivery of service to the people of Fiji and our visitors. That is why he has organized this one. And that is why I had to sacrifice a few more hours of sleep in Lotoka and travel this morning and choose selecting last night, uh, traveling last night to be here with you this morning. I apologize that I arrived late, but my program said I'm supposed to be here at 9.30 and be up here at 9.35. And you would have done all the others before I got in. That's another thing you will learn for the next workshop. If you want your guests to start at 9.30, you will have finished the prayers and everything before 9.30. looking after those you are expected to serve is the nature of Fiji. A few years ago, my paramount chief was accused of being a racist when he used the term Wulang. For those who do not speak Vosavogaviti as their mother tongue, please know today that Wulangi is a term of honor. If you have honor in yourself and you say Wulangi, you're honoring the Wulangi. If you have discrimination in your, in your nature, you're discriminating against the person you call Wulang. Because Wulang then means alien. And you are gracious by nature, and you say somebody is your Wulangi, 
you are quoting him that chief guest or guest of honor label and you act accordingly and you speak accordingly and you provide accordingly and service and serving visitors is part of the nature of Fiji the character of this land although William Bly and Captain Cook will probably not agree with that They survived. They survived. <laughs> this morning I read that somebody said, or conveyed that old adage, do not judge a book by its cover. Whether you like it or not, people do judge books by their covers. What would you have said if I came in here, saved after my morning golf round? Or after a session in the gym? You would probably think that that's how much I think of you. And if I arrived one hour late, you would think that that's the respect I have for you. So it's very, very important. Many people judge a book by the cover. You are the cover of the civil service of Fiji. People judge the service by what they see in you. I'm not saying dress up. I'm just saying develop the character that will slowly inspire confidence. My military hero said of leadership, leadership is a character that inspires confidence and the will to dominate. Field Marshal Lord Montgomery of El Alamein. So that's what you must always try and project. First of all, you must have the will to work and serve. And then have that character will inspire the confidence of the people. We don't have everything in the Public Service Commission. We don't have everything in the Public Service. So I'm encouraging the Permanent Secretary to look outside the service. And he's brought with us, uh, to us this morning some very distinguished former civil servants of Fiji. And Matt Wilson, that all prime minister has been parroting all these years. <laughs> One day he called me, Steve, you said this word this way. He said, what is it? It's supposed to be this. And I said, I'm Fijian, I'm not English. The uh, resource personnel assembled for this morning's workshop, or today's workshop, is varied and from varied backgrounds. But they've all been through the mill. Learn from them. You can only benefit. I don't know why I've gone straight to this line, the role of permanent secretaries. And here it says, leave politics to politicians. I didn't write that. But it's a good guide. Somebody told me by messenger yesterday, the civil service is full of those that supported the previous government. I didn't write back, so what? We couldn't have rolled in 
a totally new People's Assembly or coalition, coalition government friendly civil service. That's not possible, nor is it desirable. You are here because you have proven yourselves in the years that you have worked. Some of you have been promoted in the civil service from lower grades to where you are now. And you're looking forward to further promotions. We are also looking forward to that. Because then you have a continuity in the service. You have the experience in the service. Maybe sometime in the future you'll not need these workshops because you will have your own departmental workshops. They will be learning from the leaders right there where you work. I always encourage people under my command or under my leadership to speak up. Because when they speak up, those at the top learn. We all learn as we go along. If somebody below you in the scale of, of your career and is having, having problems, it could be their problem, it could be your problem. They've not been able to learn from you. You've not been able to communicate to them what is required of the output of the workforce. And remember, always remember where you are in that workforce. Are you part of the 20 or the 80? Pareto's principle. 20% of the workforce produce 80% of the output, while 80% of the workforce produce 20% of the output. Where are you in your department? Where are you in your ministry? You're here as leaders. You're part of that 20 in your workforce. Make those in the 80 become 20 in their own little groups. You'll be talk, talking about the roles of civil service, accountability, good governance, all these things that uh, nobody has taken these for granted. Because those who are now in the senior civil service uh, servant uh, positions learned these. So talk about it and convey those to those that are coming. under your leadership. <clears throat> when I was doing my instructor's course in New Zealand, an older officer who was there with us lined up. No, I was doing my left hand to captain course. And one very old captain was standing there. And General Thornton came. General Thornton was the uh, chief of the New Zealand Defense Force staff. He came up and he said, Bill, you still here? Yes, sir. What are you after? And Bill said, your job, sir. <laughs> sir Leonard Thornton was then a lieutenant general. And Bill was still going for substantive promotion to captain. We were doing the same lieutenant to captain course. Don't discourage people who are aiming at getting to where you are. Encourage them. They don't want to kick you out. They just want eventually to be there. Encourage them. If they want to be there, take, take it as a compliment. You are doing well. You are showing all the right things. That's why he wants to be there or she wants to be there. All these things you will be sharing today, I don't want to talk about my 
experiences in sports, particularly in rugby, because the former uh, Embeza Ratisoa was my head boy at school. So I won't talk about leadership at school. I learned all the good things from him. And I won't talk about my rugby career, because Ratu Tui Thawilaji was a much better rugby player than I, I ever was. Proud to be here. I want you to learn and continue learning. Absorb what you're going to share today and convey those to those under your leadership. When you see upcoming middle level or senior level civil servants, two things you can feel. One, jealousy. Second, satisfaction. Never be jealous. Everybody after us will be better than us because they've learned from everything you have given them and they, they have more time to learn some more when we move on. Be proud of the people working under your leadership. If you're not happy with them, look at yourself. And when Matt talks about writing, listen to him. I've benefited from his draft, and I know recently he's not been happy because I do not follow his draft. And as I said at the beginning, it is because of the way he drafted my speeches. Not only has he formed words, paragraphs, and speeches, the, he, has man, he has managed to get me to develop my own way of delivering the words that he may have put into one paragraph. Or even just see one word and talk about what he's talking about in that paragraph, off the cuff. It's not really off the cuff, because he's planted the thought in my mind. That's what he will be trying to tell you to do in his session today. How to write or draft a good speech, and how to deliver a good speech. I asked Pramesh when I was in uh, Lotoka, what are you going to be talking about? I read what he was going to talk about, the list of what he's going to do, that's good enough. He and Matt do not have to draft a full speech. That's what you will be able to do when you get to know your boss, who you are drafting for, and the audience. Very simple. The message that you, write, you draft will be very short, but the message will still be complete. 35,000 people in the civil service. You are the leaders in this section under my portfolios. We are the Prime Minister's office and responsibility. Prime. Prime Minister. We are the Prime Minister's staff. Every ministry will be looking after you. They will be looking up to you. Show them what we expect of them. Do not tell them what we expect, because they say, they'll say to us, then why are you doing that? Show them what we expect of them. I'm sure you'll have a very, very fruitful workshop. I wish you well, not only for today, I wish you well as you serve the people of Fiji. Now we'll